worship for us last year, and, and he did. Then ever since then, it's just we just developed a relationship. It's very special, and uh, you know, and just to watch them when they do worship, and then be involved with Tehillah worship when it happens, you know. And God's just done something very special between me and Him. And so, uh, when we begin to do this this gathering, and, and the Lord began to speak to me about what happens when a man begins to worship, and you know, He put on my heart to ask Jeremy to come and do this, and uh, without hesitation, He said, "Yeah, I've got this." He looked at his calendar first, and said, "Yeah, I've got this." So let's put our hands together for the gift that God's brought to our city. Well, well, thank you so much for having me, um, Pastor Randy. Don't you just love Pastor Randy? Isn't he awesome? He's just, a, he's just an amazing man, full of the spirit, full of, full of wisdom. And um, so thank you for having me come. I'm, I don't speak a whole lot. Um, I do. I, that comes in seasons and times. You know, you kind of go through seasons where, can you come teach this? I'm like, okay. And they're like, can you come lead worship? I'm like, okay. So, you know, I just kind of go with the flow, whatever the Holy Spirit opens the door. And if he tells me to do it, I do it. And if I don't feel it, I won't do it. I'll just say no. I've learned how to say no. That's one thing you got to learn how to do is say no. Because, you know, <clears throat> and that ties into kind of, exa I mean, it flows out of what you were just saying, flows right into what I was going to um talk to you about today, and uh, I think a lot of times, and sometimes it's our upbringing, sometimes it's, uh, it's the way we're wired in our head. You know, everyone is, everyone's different. You know, you have different types of people. Some people are very emotional. Some people are very non-emotional. That would be me. Um, although, I, with, watching me lead, I am emotional. I'm just not... I don't, I don't have my, like, I'm not, a, I'm not the type of man where um, I get hurt real easy, so I'm not super emotional, but I have a lot of friends, and a lot of people that I am con close to, very, very emotional people, and things really affect them, and I'm like, for me, I seem cold sometimes, because I'm like, what's the big deal? <laughs> you know, I'm looking, I'm like, what's, so, what's wrong with you? But that's just the way I'm wired. You know, you can't expect everyone to be like you. Everybody's different, and you have to love people and appreciate people for who they are. Not don't make everyone try and be like yourself. But one thing that I did learn in this whole process of what I do, because so you know, I Arizona's my home. It's a little bit of background. Arizona's my home. I'm a native from a little itty bitty town called Globe, Arizona. Some of you probably don't even know what that is. Little town. Um, Good, <laughs> like Apache, yeah. So, you know, uh, little town, and um, I'm kind of amazed at what the Lord's done with me, and I'm not going to go into everything with that, but um, you kind of got to take those experiences that you walk in life through that are seemingly mistakes, but God literally turns that around and gives you years of wisdom beyond what your age is. And so, you know, I go back to that, and I, um, it's amazing where God has brought me from. And now I'm home, Arizona's home, and Arizona's a strange place for me. It always has been because I've lived most of my married and ministry life. I've been married for 23 years, believe it or not, and um, I'm kind of shocked at that myself. Um, married for 23 years. I feel like my generation is the, is the breaking of a lot of curses in my life right here. And uh, so I'm home now, and Arizona's a different place for me because I have uh, spent most of my married and ministry life back east and in the south and in the north, Ohio, Toronto, Texas, Florida. You know, that's kind of where I really love to be. <laughs> Not that I don't love my home because I do. But, um, you know, these questions that you asked, that uh, Pastor Ben asked, uh, you know, you to consider, you know, how do you know you're called to do what you do? How do you know you're, caught, you know, and if you weren't doing what you were doing, what would you be doing? And what's your passion? And what are your, what's your strongest giftings? I think that was one of them, something like that. Talents, abilities. But this is one thing I had to learn the hard way. And I started the process in Bible college back in 1993. And one thing they taught us and I can't vouch for every Bible college, but one thing they taught us is you have to seek the face of God. And I know one thing, that everyone's called to different things, but we are all called to be worshipers. 
Doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what your temperament, what your personality is, we are all, not even just called, we are worshipers. We are supposed to be worshipers and praisers of the living God. And I find sometimes, depending on your background and how you've been brought up, you know, some people are more um, prone to be, you know, prone to worship a little easier than others. Some are from a more traditional background where it's not as so, you know, it's more, it was a song service. You know, you had one, two songs, and then the preliminaries. They Actually, the worship was called preliminaries, and usually one of the board members led the worship, right? <sighs> And uh, it was, you know, your two songs. And then in some of the churches I grew up, you know, that uh, we bring the sacrifice of praise was always the transition, right? It was, we bring, and then, and we offer up. I thought if I hear that one more time, I'm going to poke my eye out with a hot poker. Okay. So, you know, worship has changed, you know. And you even said back in the, the days, you know, the worship was different in the Hispanic church than it was in the, in the Caucasian churches or even the black churches. Now, I have, I have been raised around a lot of black folk all my life, so yeah, the way I feel, the way I do, the way I respond to worship, you just turn Fred Hammond on or you turn Donnie on, and I'm like, wow, you know, some people, it's Bethel. You know, everyone has different flavors. Like I said, everyone's not going to be you, but I will tell you that you have to be a seeker of Jesus. You need to become a worshiper, and we can all become worshipers. And becoming a worshiper doesn't happen here. Becoming a worshiper does not happen in church. And we think it does, but learning to worship in church does not make us a worshiper. You learn to be a worshiper when you're all alone, when you're somewhere where no one can see you, and you know what the word says, you know, when you, when you seek me in public, I will exalt you in public. When you seek me in private, I'll exalt you in public. But we need to come to the point where when we worship in private, it's not our goal. We're just worshiping in private to be exalted in public. It all comes down to, do we love Jesus? Is he enough for you? Is he, just, is he just enough? Is Jesus all you need? I mean, that's it. My identity, and I learned, because, see, I kind of am glad I found out the way. I didn't know I could sing till I was 18. I had no clue. And even then, I didn't really, not that I'm like, I'm not Donnie McClurkin or anything like that. I mean, there's a few of them, but, and he's amazing. But I didn't know I could sing until I was 18. I didn't even know I could, like, carry a tune. Let's put it that way. I didn't know I could carry a tune until I was 18 years old. And, you know, things led to one to another, went and traveled with this group that goes around the country. And then I get married, and I go to Bible college. I mean, it's like, boom. I get married. We go through a revival at our church for four months. And the Lord calls me to Bible college. I'm the first person in my family to go to college, in my immediate family. Now, others have gone to university since I've gone, but I was the first person. And I remember, let me tell you, I remember my grandfather didn't, he couldn't write, read or write. I remember my grandfather said, I need you to write this number for me, mijo. <clears throat> and um, this is on my mother's side. And he said, I need you to write $15,000, like just the numbers. And then I need you to write it out for me. Because he didn't even know how to write that. He didn't even know how to write that. So you got to understand, I come from very, very humble beginnings. And the Lord has done some amazing things. But I will tell you, when I was young, I told the Lord, I'm yours, all alone. And I said one more thing, and not everyone says this, and I don't, I don't encourage everybody to say this, but I said, Holy Spirit, I want you to possess me. I want you to be my everything. I want you to fill me so where nothing else fits but you. Nothing else but you. 
And when I said that to him, when I laid myself down at his feet, and I remember I can take you to the house I did it at. I can take you to the room, my bedroom. I was a teenager. And in the midst of all that, I'm going and clubbing at Illusions. Remember, if those of you from Tuesday remember Illusions, <laughs> Brian remembers Illusions. It was this teen club, you know, they didn't serve alcohol or anything here in Tucson. And, but I was, there was one night, the Lord, I just, I just said, you know, I'm going to seek the Lord. And in my room, on Positano Way, on the north side of Tucson, off of Shannon Road, in between Orange Grove and Ina, in my bedroom, you walk into my house, there's a hallway to the left, I'm the second bedroom. I remember I told the Lord, I want you to take me and I am yours. But in that process and in saying that, as, the, as time goes on in the next four years of my life, the Lord will get you to a place where he has to become your source. He has to become your source. And the only way for that to happen is to pray and to worship. Now, everyone's different. Everyone's got their own way, their own. Like I tell you, I've been in churches. I've been in churches, and most of the churches that I've been in and worked for, very, very multicultural, so we have, like, the whole gamut. Like, the churches I worked in Toronto, there were 72 different birth nations. That's not heritage, these people were all born in 72 and immigrated to Canada. <clears throat> and I remember, you know, we had a lot of Africans in our church. We had a lot of Islanders, Trinis, Jamaicans, you know, you know, people from Ghana and Guyana. Well, that Guyana's, Ghana's in Africa, but Guyana, Guyana's in South America. And then we'd have the Canadian white people, you know, they were very, very reserved and don't want to offend. But I will tell you, there were times you could look at that church, and I would stand on the platform, and the Holy Spirit would be moving just, I mean, literally, it's one of those types of things where you're just standing there, and things are happening, and you're like, what is this? What, what is going on? You know, you just look, and you're like, think you see this, and you see this, and you do this, and you're like, uh, I have no control over this. I don't know what's going on here, people. But, you know, the Lord's just moving, right? You just, it just happens. And I see... Everyone worshiping differently, but you can always tell. When there, were, there was this lady, her name was Holly Caulfield. Her husband was a chiropractor. She was a very tall, older woman, beautiful blonde hair. She was just a real quiet person. Not like me, you know, I scream and yell and holler and run. I'll jump off a platform. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll walk the tops of the chairs. I mean, literally, when I'm not stuck behind a keyboard. But I saw, the, I would see these people, and they would just literally be like this. But you could see that their spirits were open, and they were worshiping. And then you have the Africans, you know, they, you know, you know, they're just going to it. <clears throat> There's not a lot of African Americans in Canada, so they were like African African. <sighs> but you would see that everyone was worshiping. When you are really a worshiper. It will, it will show. But you don't become a worshiper here. You come a, become a worshiper in the closet. All by yourself. Just you and Jesus. Nobody, nobody else. Not, not there. You know, you can't, you can't learn to be a worshiper doing this. Lord, I just give you glory and praise. That's not worshiping. How many of you know, in order to become a person of the Spirit, you've got to be someone who walks in the Spirit? How many of you know, and I know this, in order to get drunk, you have to drink a lot of alcohol. You don't get drunk on one beer, although it does enamor you, but you have to drink for a while. Now, I don't drink, so just don't, let me just say that now. I'm not a drinker whatsoever. But when I did drink, I could hold my alcohol because I'm a big boy. Right, I'm a big boy. So I could drink a lot, and you wouldn't really fully tell. So it took a lot of alcohol for me to become inebriated. But it's the same way in the spirit. 
you can't just have five minutes of the Holy Spirit or five minutes of worship and, oh, I'm a worshiper. It takes time. It'd be like the same thing like in order for, for you to have a relationship with your wife, you spend five minutes of the day with her. And you have a relationship. Or what if you were courting a girl for those of you who are single? I've got five minutes today, and we're going we're gonna to build this relationship on five minutes. We'll eat really quick. I'll see you later. I've got things to do. They would be like, they, he don't love me. He doesn't want to be with me. He has no interest in me. What do you think the Holy Spirit feels? What do you think Jesus feels like when we give him five minutes? Now, I'm not saying you have to spend your whole day. I, I go through seasons, though, where literally the whole day or all night, I'm before him. But let me tell you, it takes more than just three minutes with the presence of the Lord to become a worshiper in spirit and in truth. It, it takes more than, it takes more. It just takes more. I want to go to Ephesians 5. Now, it, it tells us, it tells us, you know, Ephesians is full of a lot of different things. Paul wrote letters to all the churches because there were a lot of times things going on in the churches and they needed to correct this, they needed to correct that, they needed to correct this. But there's many, many passages, and even in the New Testament, where it says we are supposed to sing, we're supposed to worship, and we are supposed to worship in the congregation. That is necessary. Singing with each other is necessary. Being a person of the Spirit is necessary in the congregation. In uh, Ephesians 5, I think it starts at 17, yeah. I'm going to actually start reading from 15. No, 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 I'm going to start at 17. Am I right? Ephesians 17, 5. Yes. I'm going to start at, at verse 15. It says, let me, I'm going to the New Living Translation, sorry. And it actually is talking about living by the Spirit's power. It says, so careful, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make every day Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Going back to what Ben was saying, don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. So, you are supposed to sing in church. You are supposed to worship in church. It is part of what we do as a, as a congregation, as children of the Lord, as, as the church, the church, not a church, the church, right? And giving thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are supposed to do that. That's not something we're not supposed to do. But you don't become a worshiper just right in church. You have to do it on your own. One thing I love, and let me tell you this, let me just say this. I know I'm kind of weirding out on my notes here, but I think one of the, and we all know, King David was the greatest worshiper. Yes, he was, but it was more than just the fact that he was a worshiper and a psalm writer. He is one of our greatest examples that a king can be a worshiper. Just because, you know, you know, a lot of times in churches people are brought up where, oh, the singing's for the ladies. The singing's, the singing's for the women. The playing, of, that's for the women. And it's not. Some of the greatest songs that are written that every church in this world sings are mostly written by men. Do you hear what I'm saying? Most of the worship songs and praise songs that we sing in church and multiple churches, multiple cultures across the board are written by men. Now, some of those are birthed out of a gifting. Some of those are birthed out of um, 
their flesh, but the ones that remain and we sing for years are the ones that are birthed out of the Spirit. And David was a worshiper, but not only was David a worshiper, he wanted worshipers around him. When he walked into the temple, he had people worshiping and ministering before the presence of the Lord all day and all night. Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun. Those were the three families that were over the worship in the temple. Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun. And that was their job to make sure that there was worship, song, psalms, being ministered before the Lord 24 hours a day in the temple. That was also carried on in Solomon. It is important. But let me tell you something. Do you think, I mean, there are all the, a lot of times songs and, and worship is, is done in collaboration and all that stuff, and we know that. But it, it takes people who are actual worshipers, who have a, have, a worsh, have a worship on the inside of me. I was just talking to Brian, and we were talking about the questions that Ben had us asking. Like, if you weren't doing what you were doing, what would you do? You know, Brian at the time would say, well, I'd be, I'd be singing, I'd be worshiping. And he's like, <laughs> and I think this all the time, he said, I don't know what I'd do if I couldn't sing. And I'd be like, I'd probably slip my wrist. Not really, but I, w- I would feel like it. You know what I'm saying? If I couldn't sing, I'd be like, now, I don't, I don't have to play the keyboard. I, I like it, but I don't love it. I do it because I have to. But when it comes to singing, and, and you don't have to have that feeling. Just be, and I'm a singer, right? That's just what I do. But you don't have to have my voice to feel the same way. Because you know why you need to realize it doesn't matter what you sound like. It doesn't matter if you can't carry a tune in a bucket. The Lord loves your worship. Period. And he doesn't want your worship to come from me. He doesn't want your worship, and, 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 and gone are the days of the worship leader coming up here and, and worshiping for you. When did that come in the church? That's what I'm saying. When did that come in? Where it's just a guitar player singing. I'm not trying to bash. There's lots of churches like that, and the, the Lord flows. But I don't want to worship for you. And you shouldn't want to worship or allow me to worship for you. And that's what a lot of, I, I go into those churches where they're like, oh, look at him. Bless him, Lord. Oh, he's worshiping good. I'm like, what's wrong with your mouth? Yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with your hands? What's wrong with your feet? <clears throat> I think sometimes we take what we see, and this is Brandy, Pastor Randy, I was so glad you said that. Perception, your perception is your reality. Sometimes we are receiving things at us that are actually not what they really are, but we are perceiving them to be a certain way. But that's not really what is happening. Now, it's so funny. I'm, I'm really not a, a real emotional guy. I used to be a very jealous person. I used to be very, very emotional. And the Lord, the Lord delivered me of it. I mean, literally just went. <laughs> and it was like taking an octopus off of my head and all the tentacles came flying off. I, can, I remember when he did that. I was a very jealous person. Very emotional. And I think the Lord maybe swung me so far the other way that I don't really care what people think about me. I'm not looking for my next church to sing in. I'm not looking for my next ministry engagement. If it happens, it happens. I'm not worried about it. People tell me, oh, I want to have you at my church all the time. I'm like, that's great. But if it doesn't happen, I'm not going to be like, oh, my God, I can't believe you didn't have me at church when you told me. I was like, no, no, no. Because my identity, I'm a worship leader, but that's not who I am. Who I am is God's son. Who I am, and take it from, take it from me, someone who grew, out with, grew up without fathers consistently in their life, I had to learn, and the Lord taught me this the hard way. I always looked for a man in my life, someone just to, you know, just to a fatherly figure. And every one of them would be like, shoo, shoo, pulled out of my life. Shoo. And finally, the Lord told me, when am I going to be the only father you need? 
And it was in one of those times when I was all by myself, alone, no one else around. He's like, when am I going to be what you need? When am I going to be? Now, don't get me wrong. There are men in my life who have permission, who can correct me when they see things in my life. I have brothers. I have people that are like, hey, you need to look at this. And I'm like, okay, yeah, 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 I will. I will. And amen. Who said, who said you need to listen to your wife? Who was that? That was Ben. I'm telling you what. Your wife needs to be your spiritual barometer. Because you know why? Women sense, thing in the, sense things in the spirit that we are oblivious to. Because that's just the way we're made. We're, we compartmentalize. I have the uncanny ability to compartmentalize every little thing in my life. This has nothing to do with that. But in a woman's mind, everything has to do with everything. Everything touches everything. Everything is because of everything. I'm like, sweet Jesus. I just need to go to a movie and see killing. You know what I'm saying? I just need to go to a movie and see fighting or something. You know what I'm saying? And that's just, that's just the way we're wired, right? That's just the way we are. <clears throat> now, I'm not Mr. Macho Alpha Male guy here either. You know, don't get me wrong. I'm not Mr. You know, ugh. you know, I'm just, that's not who I am. I am God's son. I'm a child of Jesus. And to me, that's all that matters to me. I don't care if I get up there and you clap a hand. I'm up there because that's what I'm supposed to do. And I'm going to do it regardless of what you do. My goal is not to get you all worked up. I could care less. I could care less. My job is to lead you somewhere. And if you want to come with me, let's go. If you don't, that's great. Because you know why everybody's in different places in their relationship with God. Everybody's in a different place in the Lord. And there's people that are far, far, far ahead of me. Far, far, far ahead of me. I put myself around people who were spirit people, who lived after the spirit, who walked in the spirit. When was the last time you asked the Holy Spirit, am I supposed to do this? I'm not talking about should I wear a red shirt or a green shirt because God don't care. There's a decision in front of you, and you said, Holy Spirit, what am I supposed to do? And I have gone through, like, years silence. So in my mind, that means don't do anything. Don't do anything. But I, have, I, I really, truly believe that being a kingly worshiper, a priestly worshiper, goes hand in hand with how badly or how much you seek Jesus. Because in his presence is everything you need. Not in his presence here. Not in his presence in this house. We have got to get away from having to be stuck to your mama's titty. In the spirit. Excuse me, I'm amongst men. I should be able to say that. This, we, we consider this person our, our spiritual breast. And all we want to do is just sit there, grown men... Going after the breast. When are you going to let go and seek God for yourself? Don't depend on Him. You should come full with the Spirit and ready to assist. I mean, why are we always coming so needy? Why are we so needy? Dang. Stop coming here. This is not your food. This is your direction. This is your guidance. This is your correction. This is your steering wheel. That's what this is. Also, the worship leader is your steering wheel, is your guidance, is your person that brings you into the presence of the Lord together. There's a reason why God made man and woman in the same way. How many of you know I just like to be around men? You know, sometimes I just, I don't want to be, I don't want to hear a woman's voice. I just want to be around men. You know what I'm saying? I just, 
I, I love my wife. I have I, wife and daughter, and I had a female dog for the longest time. I'm like, sweet Lord, please. I need, I need a man in this house. I, I got to get out of here. I got to go with one of my friends. But how many of you know that you need worship in your life? Worship is not for women. Worship is not a, and worship is not just a feminine thing. I think we have that misconception a lot of times. I'm not saying everyone here does. There are those that do. <clears throat> that if I raise my hand and if I'm crying or, you know, because I'm not much of a crier, but when it comes to the people that I love and it comes to the presence, first of all, the presence of the Lord and the people that I love, I will cry. I cry, I blubbered myself all over Tehillah one, 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 one time because my best friend Roy, he, my keyboard player lives in Canada. He's from Toronto. <clears throat> and he comes for as many as he can make. And um, I counted a privilege to minister with him. And more so than, you got to understand, you got to understand, if how many of you are, like play an instrument or worship or sing in your church? Does anybody in this room do that but me and Ben? Up high, up high. <clears throat> you got to learn to build relationships with your musicians apart from just needing them. It comes down to your character too. Why do you pray? Why do you seek the face? Why do you worship? Is it because you need God or is it because you love him? It is both, and that's what it should be. But first, it should be because you love him. First, 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 first. You just love him. I don't worship the Lord for his benefits. I don't lead worship services for the manifestations. We just want him. Because, you know, the manifestations just happen. But if you're looking for him and he shows up, it's just going to happen. Even in your life as a, a worshiper, as a kingly worshiper. How many, of you, how many of you read Psalms and where David is crying out to the Lord all by himself? And when the Lord shows up, he's like, that's all I need. I don't need anything. I just need, I need to make sure you're there. Moses, the same way. I'll go, but if you don't go with me, I'm not going. But a life of worship, a life of prayer, a life in the spirit, seeking after the face of God. David was a man after God's own heart. David was very flawed also. I'm flawed, let me tell you. Let me tell you. I like food. I can look at a grain of rice and gain 16 pounds. That's just the way my body is. I can look at the juice in that cup and it's like five pounds on right now. I, mean, I just have that metabolism just slower than snot. I grew up a rail. So I don't have like that fat kid complex. You know, you grew up fat and you're like, I'm always fat. I, I forget I'm fat till I look in the mirror. And I'm like, you need to lose some weight. Dang. But it's all about our perception. It's all about our perception of ourselves, of God, of God in us, of how God responds to us, how God reacts to us. Are we seeking him for stuff? Are we worshiping him for stuff? Do we come in here and worship him because we, we need his presence to come in so he can fix me? No, the real, the real fixing happens when you're all alone. The fixing that lasts happens when you're alone. The fixing lasts, the, the, the long, long, long. I tell you what, I have had my laid hands laid on so much. I am a prophecy magnet. I'm telling you, people see me and they have a word for me. And it's, it's you know, the prophetic gift just kind of, I have a prophetic flow. I'm not a prophet. I have a prophetic flow of what I do. So, I mean, and I think just people who are prophetic are just like, Shoo. you know, and they just nail me. And I'm like, I've had words spoken over me. I've had hands laid on me. I've had hands laid on me by really great men, generals in the faith. And the Lord did something. But the stuff that he really reached in and 
took a hold of and literally ripped out of me was when I finally submitted to his presence and I was worshiping him all alone and I would wait before his presence. That's kind of how it works with me. I worship, I wait, I pray. I worship, I wait, I pray. You know, it takes me like an hour just to clear my mind, to get myself in the presence of the Lord. I'm like, I have to think about everything. And then I finally, finally, I feel like my mind's cleared enough, and this has been shut off long enough to where I can focus on him. And then I begin to worship. There's a reason why we are so moved by music. There's a reason why we can be influenced by music, chords, vibrations. They affect us. You've all heard this analogy. You can walk into a scary movie, and if there was no music, you'd be like, it's not real scary. But you add that music in there, and it changes the whole atmosphere of the place. Do you know that music and worship ride, the anointing rides on music? The anointing rides on notes and chords and lots of different things. What's in your vessel? Are you a worshiper? What's flowing out of you? You know, how bad do you want him? Do you, want, do you even want to be a worshiper? Let me ask that question. Do you want to be a worshiper? Some people are like, ah, oh, music's, music's neither here nor there to me. And there are people like that. There really are. They're like, music isn't just not a motivator for them, right? Some it's like, it's got to have a, a banjo, a guitar, a jaw harp, or, you know, something like that. For others, it's got to have, like, Hammond B3 organ. It's not church unless there's a Hammond. You know? Now, don't get me wrong. I love a Hammond B3 organ and someone who can play it well. But that's not church. We are the church. Church is just celebration time. Just like, just like what Pastor Ben was saying. Is coming to church your idea? Is, is that your only connection to, what, to the things of God? Are you only a worshiper in church? Are you, do, you only, do you only worship in church? I will tell you what. <laughs> I, if you get to the point where you can't live without it, you have to worship. I have to worship. I have to. With people, without people, I got to do it all. I love worshiping with people because it's just amazing. One can chase a 1,000, two can chase 10,000. Could you imagine if we had a meeting, if, we, if they held a meeting with a room full of people, because it only takes a couple, room full of people filled with the Holy Spirit, worship pouring out of them when they walk in. They've already been worshiping. Not coming, I'm coming into worship because God, I need it today. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you do. We're all human. But if we came in full of worship in our spirits, almost to bursting, can you imagine what the Lord would do in that service? Can you imagine the lives that would be changed? Can you imagine what he would do in you in, as, in, in believers coming to worship together? But that can only start and spark when you do it on your own, when you become a worshiper. When a worship, worshiping is just who you are. It's the same thing as what's your identity? Is your identity in your job? Is your identity in your cars? Is your identity in your position? Is your identity in your family? Or is he your identity? I'm just a worshiper. I'm just a worshiper. That's all I am. It was like, are you a pastor? Sure. Are you this? Are you that? Yeah. But I don't have to do that ever again. And I've gone through seasons where I haven't done it for long periods of time. Because that's not who I am. It's what I do. And worship is who I am. But are you God's child first? Are you his worshiper first? 
Are you his kingly worshiper? What is your perception of yourself as a worshiper? Do you see yourself as a worshiper? Like if I say, are you a worshiper? You know, do you just do you just crave his presence? Are you a worshiper? Or are you like, yeah, I love song service. I like to sing a song here and there. How do you perceive yourself as a worshiper? Can you even perceive yourself as a worshiper? A real worshiper? Can you perceive yourself as a real worshiper? Pastor Randy, how much time do I have? I don't know. Five minutes? Okay. He said four. <laughs> jokes. Always jokes. So let me just tell you something. Let me just challenge you. Let me just dare you. I triple dog dare you. And that was like the dare you never wanted to back down from, right? Triple dog dare you. I triple dog dare you to spend an hour, a whole hour, not 15 minutes, a whole hour. Wow, my God. I don't know if I can sing that long. An hour worshiping the Lord, worshiping the Lord all by yourself. I challenge you. I, I, no, I don't challenge you. I dare you. I dare you do it a lot of times it's my car i can't tell you how many times i have the 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 volume up so loud from my iphone and i forget to turn it back down and my wife saw i just about peed my pants when i got in the car because you had it so stinking loud but there wasn't on a station right because i had the aux in she was like (laughs) i was like oh sorry I dare you to worship the Lord for an hour. Just once and see what happens. Just once. All by yourself. Not in church. That doesn't count. You lose if it's in church. But I dare you to worship all by yourself for one hour and see what happens. Then I... Quadruple dog dare you to do it again in the same week. Do it twice in one week. And just, just see what happens. Just the Indian, just see what happens. Just see. Just see what happens. The Lord will change you. He'll make you a worshiper. Now these notes that I have in this, in this thing, if you've got it, they're really good. I don't really, I didn't hardly hit any of them. I just, <laughs> sorry, Pastor Randy. I really plan to do them. But I dare you. I dare you. I dare you. Because you know what? I don't have to worry about it. Because I'm not the anointer. I'm not the one with the presence. What I have doesn't belong to me. What I have didn't come from me. What I have didn't come from my voice. What I have didn't come from my fingers. What I have didn't come from my dad, my mom, my wife. It comes from him. Now, I paid a price, and I still pay a price. Because what I have doesn't come cheap. But everyone can have it. See, that was one thing. I Just a little story. I got one little story here. <clears throat> Dr. Sumrall, who is the pastor of my pastor, he, of course, he's gone on. Donahue wanted to have him on because he was like one of the, the leading guys in, in, in uh, you know, casting out devil's demonology, right? And Donahue said, I want you to come on and I want you to talk to the, the, you know, the U.S. about you know, demons and casting devils out. And he goes, I will on one circumstance, one condition, one condition. I can tell everybody that anybody can do it. And he's like, no, 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 you're the expert, you're the expert. He goes, no, no, no. My condition is that I can tell everybody on your air that anybody can cast the devil out if they seek me, if they have a clean vessel. And this is coming from the man 
who way back in the day in the Philippines, that real bad demon-possessed little guy in Billy Bid Prison cast the devil out. And do you know how he did it? Let me, you, want, you want to know how this, how Dr. Summerall cast this one devil out? Let me tell you. Because you become a worshiper, devils are going to manifest. You don't have to go looking for them. You don't have to, healings will just happen. People will be filled with the spirit. You don't have to pray for them. You have to do nothing. It'll just happen. Literally, you, it, and, and I'm not talking about in a service. I remember the days in the charismatic movement where the spirit really moved in our homes. It wasn't in church. We were in a prayer meeting and demons would come. We would just cast devils out. We didn't need a big audience. We didn't need, a, you know, a thousand people and the devil will come out if there's a thousand people in the house. That's ridiculous. They'll find you if the Lord has ordained for it to happen. You know how he, he cast that devil out? He would go and pray and worship. And then he would come into the jail and he would stand in front of her. He wouldn't say a word. And he'd walk out because it wouldn't come out. He'd go back the whole day, pray and worship. And then he'd come back and he'd stand in front of her. And it wouldn't come out. He's up. Like, I'm going back. He would pray and worship. Pray and worship. He'd come back. And he would stand in front of her. I don't know if it was a boy or a girl, man. I can't remember now. I think it was a her. It was a girl, wasn't it? Yeah. <sighs> And finally, after so many days, that thing came out. And today, from one little act, there's a church in Manila, pastored by his nephew, 100,000 people in Manila today. Just because someone would pay a price. Dr. Sumrall was a worshiper. Now, he was old school. I mean, he was like, his favorite song was, Oh, the blood of Jesus. He would, every time he came, and we had to sing that song till the cows came home. But he would worship, and he would just lift his hands, and he would just start crying, and he would start crying. And the presence of the Lord would just come. It would just come. I remember we went to Israel one time with him, and we were out on the Sea of Galilee, and we were in like three boats. We pulled them all together. And Dr. Summerall started singing, Oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes white as snow. And it was like, it was windy, it was blowing, you know, there was a bit of a ripple of the waves. Literally, we started singing that song, and it just went, Phew. And I tell you what, people started getting healed. No one was praying for anybody. So it doesn't matter how old you are doesn't matter what worship or the style you are. Just be a worshiper. Just be a worshiper and know who you are, that you are a king and a priest. Don't let that get to your head, but just be confident. Be confident in who you are. Be confident in what, be confident, Pastor Ben, and what the Lord has called you to do, and be confident in who you are, and that he is your identity. Not my voice, not the church, not your pastor. I know I've gone more than five minutes. Not anybody else. But just be confident in who you are. Let me tell you, let me tell you what, what being confident, not cocky, not arrogant, but confident in who you are will do. People think I play the piano way better than I do. I'm like, man, you're so good. I'm like, mm, you should hear the people that play for me. And you'd be like, you suck, you know. But I sound okay because I'm confident in what I know. I'm not timid when I get on the keyboard. I know what my capabilities are. I know what I can do. I know the chord structures that I'm comfortable with. I know where I can go. Confidence takes you really far in life. If you're confident in who you are, it's not a fact of, oh, look at him. He's all. No, it's just, a, I just, I know. I'm secure. And my security ultimately comes from him. You know what Dr. Summerall said faith was? I don't know why I'm talking about him today. Dr. Summerall said, you know what faith is? And it's like, you know, these old, these old school people, they just like nail it to the floor, you know, for you. you know, they don't get all flowery. They just say it. 
he would say, faith, and he would do this, faith, and he would do this. Faith is simply knowing. Do we know him? I want to know him. I don't feel like I know him like I should. I've been in ministry 23 years. I don't feel like I know God like I should. But I'm seeking him. Are there hard times? Oh, yeah. I mean, all hell comes down. Doesn't matter where you are. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how much money you have. Doesn't matter how secure you are. It doesn't matter. The devil will rain down hell on you. Sometimes our decisions will rain down hell on us. But be confident that you know him and that he loves you. And all he wants is our obedience and worship. And you will find out how to be a worshiper. I love you guys. Awesome.